Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 184, Investment Trusts with Andrew from Ireland. Dividend Talk is your number one podcast for all things dividend and stock market related with a unique European flavor. My name is Derek from Engineer My Freedom and I'm joined with my co-host European DJI. If you want to learn more about us, please visit europeandji.com where we have articles on dividend growth investing, including 30 European dividend aristocrats. While you're there, you might as well grab our free dividend portfolio tracker template. We also offer a premium dividend growth service featuring a bi-weekly newsletter which includes stock deep dives, dividend stock cards and access to our dashboard with over 130 dividend growth stocks. All of this is based on our very own dividend safety analysis. But enough about that, please grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. Hey, European DJ. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. Uh, I was actually looking forward for today's show because uh, we are going to talk about a topic we actually never really talk about. And then now with uh, a specialist uh, in the case of Andrew. So, yeah, other than that, of course, my uh, work, uh, my week was only working. I haven't really checked anything, but today I checked my portfolio and it was nice to see that it continues to grow and that dividends uh, keep coming in. That's the nice thing about this, right? We don't really lie awake from, uh, I would say, it's share volatility and everything because we know the dividends create a nice safety net. And uh, yeah, yeah, good to yeah. be an investor when you're busy with other stuff. Exactly. Well, particularly a dividend growth investor. But like you, I'm quite excited about today's topic. We're going to talk about investment trusts. Um, I've done my best to introduce them uh, over the last few weeks uh, on a basic level, but I've, I've spoke to Andrew couple of times before he's 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 a huge member actually in the irish fi um community he's he's been on a number of podcasts discussing this so i'm quite excited so andrew welcome to dividend talk hi guys great to be on long time listener long time fan so uh yeah no i'm uh, excited about spreading the good word <laughs> so yeah so people might notice there's now two irish accents that you have to try and dissect on this podcast but look i'm i'm really excited to have you here um maybe you could just give a little bit of a background of maybe who you are or maybe something about the fi community uh, just just so mm. our listeners are aware yeah so um well i'm actually a long time member of the limerick fi group which is in uh, it's a city in the west of ireland and um, i've more or less been a member of that since it started around 2016. um i'm a long time investor maybe around 20 odd years uh, my 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 dad has uh, an interest in it as well, which has always been helpful. Um, I'm actually a civil engineer by profession, so that's roads, bridges, large buildings, that sort of stuff. And uh, you know that engineering analytical approach I've always found has been very helpful, very interesting when it comes to investing. Um, yeah, I've, uh, very similar to yourself, uh, to you two guys of young family at home as well so uh time can be at a bit of a premium at time but you know uh, yeah i enjoy i enjoy investing and it's as much of a hobby as anything else so yeah that's my background good good but look we'll, we'll dive into some questions in a short bit and i'm sure we have loads of questions it's a, a new enough topic for us um i know it's all about dividend growth and, and we'll get into that as well so we look forward to that but beforehand is there any news, European DJ, um, that you came across this week? Nothing special. However, we had some good dividend hikes again because yes. I think many, many people uh, actually know that we're a big fan of Alt Del Heze. They hiked the dividend by 4.8%. So we'll get now uh, 1 euro and 10 cents. Uh, per share annually and also they announced again a 1 billion share buyback and this is what i like so much about this right it, it generates around 2.2 2.3 billion in uh, free cash flow each year 
and they continue to buy back one billion in shares, which is approximately every year two and a half to three, three and a half percent, depending on where the share price is at the time. So, you know, if you look at this 4.8% hike, two thirds of that is probably generated again by share buybacks without going into depth. And for me, this is really nice where you get a really nice combination of buybacks and, and continued dividend growth over time. And yeah, for me, this is always uh, very interesting. And of course, we have the, the buybacking in the, in the form of HP Inc. Uh, yeah. as such. And it shows a bit of a power, right? Of course, from a capital allocation uh, point of view, I always prefer growing dividend first before buybacks. But I think Alta has it, does it really wisely here because they do buy back and then they also, let's say, yeah, can continue to grow to grow the dividend. And if they do a little bit better, they can give us uh, almost a double digit hike. But this year we need to do it with one uh, one on the lower end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they always seem to buy back when when they're at their lowest as well. They they seem to time that pretty well. We we do have to warn our listeners though. They use that phrase "laser focused" in their oh. hash report. <laughs> yeah, so. I saw that and I felt like, oh dear, oh dear, where 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 will this start? And actually, I, I put on on Twitter, but maybe one of the listeners is a data scientist. I would love to see someone that can data scrape the uh, press releases. And then connect it to the next 12 month uh, share performance, share price performance, and tell me whether the occurrence of laser focused in the press release, let's say in the first two pages, results into an underperformance <laughs> compared to the their own index, national index. <laughs> because I think so. I think about all the CEOs that have been starting to say that laser focused. I think they also say it because usually when they use it in an, uh, a cost control context. Yeah. And when are you really focused on? cost control or laser focused on that of course when you are in trouble on the on the revenue side yeah, yeah. or when it, when it's hard so i think there is something uh, into this but for sure it, uh, it should be on the bingo card uh, for management bs right yeah let's keep an eye let's keep an eye on our hold and see we, we have a baseline we can we can base these <laughs> yes see, exactly yeah they do um coca-cola have hiked their dividend by 5.4 percent not quite as big as pepsi but still i think it's still a decent hike for yeah but they're in a much more healthier shape I, i'm not too worried of course about pepsi but i do feel it's really on the high end and they don't have any wiggle room so i would have loved pepsi to do a little bit less uh, these years yeah yeah and um, schneider electric hikes it by 11 percent, which is another big big hike um, you own it already yes yeah, so I, I only have a small position a couple of shares they, they always seem overvalued so I bought a small position just to have them, but I, I really love them to, to drop into a okay, more nice, nice, manageable nice. position. But yeah, eleven percent I can't can't complain, even if it is small. Um Royal Vopac then with fifteen percent dividend hike to one euro fifty. Mm -hmm. And then Moody's. Actually, we always forget about these credit rating and these types of companies, but Moody's hiked it by ten point four percent, which is quite substantial. Yeah. For me, Moody's has such a strong mode. Look at those three uh, rating agencies. I know that others tried it, but effectively they have such a mode. It's hard to, for, comp for for new entrants, right? Yeah. So they even survived the global financial crisis when everyone hated them. They're still yeah. around. It's actually a company you should probably look a little bit deeper into one time. Yeah. They only have one, one competitor in Standard & Poor's. Really yes. SP. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and they only hiked their dividend by one point five percent, I think, wasn't it? Recently? Yes. They had a, yes. a, a poor. So it's yes. interesting to compare both it just in terms of dividend, not nothing else at the moment. But it's interesting to see one with a double digit hike and then one with one point five. So it's um mm. it's quite a contrast. Yeah. Yeah, and then the last but not least, of course, um I was once on a on a blue Monday. I uh was a big fan of Castellum until the ceo at a certain moment well, made a mess out of this uh when they when they cut the dividend as well and before and just with the whole ceo fiasco there but also uh, for 2024 they decided not to pay a dividend so i think it's really for me uh over with this one i'll never look back at that one i burnt my hands on it i, I didn't really sell it with a loss i mean a little bit but uh, i redeployed the money elsewhere in a in a better environment yeah. for me yeah that that was a tough one because it kind of the ceo changed out of the blue with, with no real yeah. warning or, or no real yeah. foresight behind it so that's yeah, an interesting one so 
Andrew, investment trust. So we'll, we'll, we'll get yeah. on to some questions about that. But before we get into that, maybe you might take us back to when you started investing, particularly in Ireland, because I know property is probably big. So it's probably a journey like a lot of us in Ireland. Um, so can you take me back to how you started investing and what kind of inspired you? Yeah, so I, I started investing um, around 2001, 2002. Well, maybe so fairly young, really, especially young for on an Irish standard. Um, and uh, I was reading a lot about it, had a great interest in it, decided I would dip my toe and I set up an account with Dolman Stockbrokers. They were a, an Irish stockbroking firm at the time. Um, but it was such a different world, completely different. You, you know, everything was high fees, large volumes. Stockbrokers had no great interest in young guys like me with a couple hundred euros to invest and trying to get started. Uh, I built it up a bit, got going. Um, Dolman eventually got bought out by Cantor Fitzgerald. Fees got even worse, Cantor Fitzgerald, the American stock brokerage. Um, then I ultimately, um, around 2000, I think, 16, 17, DeGero finally came to Ireland. I uh, transferred lock, stock and barrel and said goodbye to the large American fees and moved into DeGero, which was an eye opener. It, was, it made a world of a difference. And uh, at the time, at that early stages, I was your classic uh, Gordon Gecko type investing. And it was funny. <laughs> it was funny. I heard a guy on your podcast a couple of weeks ago and he had a great saying that the more you touch your portfolio, the smaller it gets. It's like a bar of soap. Yes. Thought, yeah. <laughs> it was a perfect example, really, you know. And I had a couple of good wins, you know, but small stuff. And I was just like everyone, really terrible at timing. And so I sort of realized after a while it was just buy and leave it sit there and just let it do it do its thing but again that took time took experience a little bit of loss stuff like that yeah but um then yeah look i suppose that's how i got started um but uh I, and then ultimately you know i learned that and look your guy you guys really kind of uh, amplify it here every week that you need to be on top of your game to be you need to be constantly reading the reports constantly keeping up with earnings um and, and finding out what's going on and uh, you know i had just a couple of shares kept it very focused but then life got involved you know wife kids everything yeah. else and you let it slip a bit all of a sudden you, lo you lose on this you lose on the other and then fast forward for me fast forward into 2009 and I had two big holdings of two Irish banks. Now it's okay. not too <laughs> it's not too often someone tells you that they two of their shares drop by ninety nine percent. Yes, and yes. That, Hallelujah. That, that genuinely happened in two blue, big banks. Uh, big banks, uh, Bank of Ireland and AIB. Yeah. Uh, ninety nine percent phenomenal loss. Yeah, and they've never really regained it today. But, I uh, should send you uh, this t shirt of bankers are wankers. <laughs> I think you would appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, I was lucky. I had no, I had no shares in Anglo Irish Bank. Actually, they went bankrupt completely. Yeah, yeah they went out of the market. But did that change then your strategy? How did that change your thinking and and shape your oh, in investment philosophy? Yeah, so that that changed it radically, really, because um, you know uh, I had lost so much, and uh, then. Actually, I still had a, a decent enough portfolio around that time. And look, I, I actually, around 2013, I completely liquidated my portfolio, completely sold everything. Now, I was lucky enough, it was of a reasonable enough size. I actually used the money to build my house. So that, and if you were ever to build a house, 2013 was the time to build a house. So yes, that's a return on investment. Yeah. yeah. So then after that, I start a few years later, then I started to build up again and I've been building ever since. Uh, but you know there was a lot of lessons to learn there and i had learned that capital appreciation and investing for purely capital appreciation total return was a bit of a waste of time as far as i could see it after the, the experiences i'd had with the banks and this sort of thing so i started to move into dividend investing and i started looking at what was happening in uh, in the states which obviously was big there but as we know as three people who were into income investing it is just not big in europe or definitely wasn't then anyway yeah, yeah, and particularly in Ireland, it's it's not 
it's not really it's still not big here to be fair no not at all people actually have no idea what you're talking about when you, if you try to talk to someone about it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um, um yeah no uh and then in the beginning i actually had a, a corporate job and um i had a sort of a high a high income job so i actually moved into etf income investing to start with and um, actually it's tax efficient enough in ireland because there's a flat tax on ETF income at 41%, which is about 11% uh, better than uh, income tax on dividends, which is 52% in Ireland. So ETF investing in some ways uh, for income is better. But as I found as the years went on, uh, because ETFs are uh, open-ended funds, they have no ability to withhold money. So if you if you have if they have some really good years and say they have a lot of say uh, commodity stocks in there or they have a lot of uh, something like that and they they pay huge amounts of cash but it's completely unreliable. So you could get one quarter you could get a massive payout and the next quarter you could get maybe pence you know you could get nothing. Yeah. It makes no sense. So I realized if I was going to rely on this as a potential fire strategy to have income and to live off this in the future it was not reliable it was not the way to go so i started to look around for alternatives and that's where i found investment trusts i actually funny enough i had one in my portfolio for a few years and i hadn't even realized i had fnc a foreign yeah. and colonial investment trust it's actually the oldest investment trust but uh hadn't even realized that kem recommended uh from a friend uh and then the more I researched, the more I, I found out about them as an income strategy. Then, you know, so that's what I started really. So, so what? I mean, you mentioned ETFs and open-ended funds. What What is an investment trust, and, and how does it differ from an ETF? It's actually it's probably it's probably important to say what they're not. So, what they're not is an American mutual fund. There's a perception out there, especially in the fire community. Oh my God! Uh, actively managed fund or like the spawn, like the the devil, you know. Uh, my God, don't touch it at all costs. They're going to take all your money and run away with it. Um, you know, and and the American mutual funds are cursed by the two and twenty rule. You know, historically they would have had this. They charged a two percent ongoing fee and then twenty percent performance fee. Criminal uh, uh, sort of fees, and that's that's. Uh, what the american investors would have uh, in their head as mutual funds uh, but um so so they're definitely not that so like uh, there is mutual funds in ireland and the uk and the rest of europe and they're all open-ended funds uh, they're purely a fund whereas investment trusts are a closed-ended fund so they're a company an investment company there's no great difference to them than any sort of uh, real estate investment trust uh, that deals with property saying people will be a lot more familiar with those but most real estate investment trusts that we're going to talk about today here will deal with equity or alternative assets or corporate bonds or uh, private equity or hedge funds they're just a, a non-aligned alternative income stream yeah. that i think all investors should have in their income investors should have in their portfolio you know because they're it's my experience they tend to be low beta and they tend not to be uh already attached or in line with what's going on with the wider market uh, so uh, you know they 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 fit in much better but um yeah so what I, I wanted to talk about mainly was the 400 um investment trusts that exist in the uk uh, and they actually mainly call themselves actually investment companies and maybe that's a better way of describing them because that's fundamentally what they are but they often get mixed up as funds rather than companies yeah. and you you maybe just here for specifically we have a lot of listeners that are beginners right and you use the term open-ended and closed-ended can you explain a little bit like what this actually means for uh, for investors yeah so uh, a closed-ended fund so uh, an investment trust that means it just has a set amount of shares so let's just call it a million shares and that's what they that's what they have and so the day that they had their ipo their initial public offering the very first day um they launched a million shares onto the market at one pound or at one euro or whatever the currency may be and that's how the company was valued at that time and that's all that exists unless unless 
at some future point, the, the, the company gets uh, very valuable and exceeds its net asset, asset value. And possibly the company could issue more shares, but that would get complicated to explain. So maybe we won't go yeah. into that. Yeah, but ge generally, <laughs> generally speaking, they just have a set amount, so a fixed amount of shares. Whereas an open-ended fund, that's your mutual fund, fund, that's your ETF. So the more money they get in, the more shares they issue. They just keep issuing shares, issuing shares, and they have redemptions, which is actually we'll talk about later on, but that's where investment trusts don't have that because they issue their funds onto the market. You buy their, you buy their, sorry, their shares onto the market. You buy the shares on the market like you buy a share in any other company. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you want to sell it, there needs to be a buyer. 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you whereas, also use the, uh, sorry, yeah, so you, whereas with a with a closed end or with a an open ended fund, you're actually selling them uh, back to the to the fund itself. And yeah, the manager he needs to he needs to sell his assets because he becomes a forced seller, you know, to give you yeah, cash. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have heard such stories in the past that suddenly uh, the, those open ended funds, let's say, really uh, well lost a lot of money for their clients yeah. uh, because of that. Yeah. yeah and then then there is also something like the net asset value that you also briefly touched on what what's that in the in the in the context of a closed end fund yeah so we go back to our uh, our million shares and uh, so we now we have a million shares so and they they uh, trade at a certain value so the net asset value is um how much their assets are worth you know so if if that company just had um a million cars at one euro each um then in theory it's worth you know a, a million euros but people might not be willing to pay a million euros so they might be only a, a willing to pay half a million euros so then all of a sudden this is it will be trading at a 50 percent discount and you will always hear people talk about discount to nav that is mm -hmm. very common with investment trusts and actually it's a very good way of invest of valuing them and we'll talk about that maybe yeah. later as well yeah super uh thank you i think th these are two terms that are very important uh for the rest of the discussion yeah no for sure you're 100 right yeah yeah so I, I think you've touched on on it briefly but maybe you can just outline some of the benefits of investment trusts and, and why why should we invest in them in the first place um that's <laughs> from an irish perspective they have a very unusual asset uh or uh, advantage in that um in Ireland, they're actually they're dealt with from a tax perspective as a normal share. So you know they de they're dealt with like normal co uh, income tax for on yeah. dividends and uh, on the capital gains. It's normal. So you know from an Irish perspective, that's an advantage. But look, they're easy to access. They're easy to research. And when I when I say that, you can go on a website called uh, Association of Investment Companies. They have a database of the 400 investment trusts. You literally just Google that, it'll come up. They have a screening tool. You can use that. You can screen on uh, performance, uh, dividends, uh, gearing, um, charge, ongoing charges, uh, dividend. What you're, And you can screen, start screening out this, or you can screen on team. So if you're looking for a particular team, Anything from corporate bonds to UK smaller companies to corporate debt to anything in between, uh, any sort of investment team you can think of, there is an investment trust for it. So um, I actually think the AIC website is like having your own little private Bloomberg terminal, you know, for free. Yeah, you can go on there. Everything's free of charge. All the information is in the same format. All the annual reports are there um all the performance data all the dividend data it's it's yeah. it's, a, it's a great tool yeah. it, is, it is a fantastic website um but you you mentioned along away some terms such as gearing um what what does that mean why why is that significant yeah so um because these are companies and not funds they have the ability to go to the bank and get a loan so this gives them a huge advantage in a downward market and uh, maybe a bit of a disadvantage in an upward market because uh so as the market's going down, they can go to they can go to the to a lender. They can get a loan at whatever fee, um, and um, they can buy in a downward market, and they can buy at great value. And you will see actually a lot of the investment trusts. Some of them show sort of 
out of proportion performance over the last few years because uh, they're moving into a five-year period and some of them would have bought very heavily during the COVID period because yeah. they were able to go to the bank and get a loan. And that's the difference, whereas the, the fund we talked about earlier, the, the open and the fund, they had to sell at that period because their investors wanted their cash back, whereas our investment companies, they were all buying during that period because they were able to go to the bank and get a loan and they were able to gear. Yeah. But if we're valuing an investment trust, um, and we're looking to buy one ourselves, we need to be very aware of what their gearing percentage is to NAV. It's always described as a percentage to NAV. And nearly all investment trusts in their constitution have it. They have a range of what their maximum al allowed go up. It's usually maybe 20, 25%. But some of the property investment trusts, they have a very high, you know, because they're mortgaging a lot of them. So they, they can be up to 70, 80%. But yeah, so it's important to be, be cognizant of it. Yeah, cause it, it sounds like that during COVID they could they could borrow, uh, which obviously elevated their their gain say over the next three or four years. But it, that could also have the opposite effect and compound their losses. It was a terrible risk, exactly, because if the market had kept going down, now they're uh, they have uh, they have a big debt as bad, as well as everything as as low share price. So yeah. yeah, it can it can be a double edged sword for sure. So. What about fees then? You talk about investment managers. We don't have that when we pick individual stocks. We don't have that with ETFs. Um, do you worry about fees? What What is the importance even of, of the investment manager here? Actually, sorry, just before we want fees, maybe another huge advantage for us as income investors is the ability of investment trusts to retain cash. So they're actually, okay. uh, under UK law, they're all allowed to retain up to 15% uh, of their cash that they bring in and they hold on to that 15 percent yeah and a lot of them use it then to drip feed it out so a prime example and i have a great statistic i often tell people that the aac ran um, a poll of all uh, investment funds both open-ended and closed-ended during COVID in 2020 and of those income investment funds so let's call it both in both open and closed-ended 85 percent of the investment trusts uh, raised their dividend during the COVID 2020 year, wow. whereas 23 percent of the 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 open ended funds only raised it. So uh, the other 77 uh, percent didn't. You know, it, it's a it's a it's a huge advantage they have over the wider industry, um, and and that will lead us on maybe to talk about uh dividend heroes and next generation dividend heroes maybe later on and their ability to do that and how important it is to invest in trust but but yeah we could we should we should talk about that in a while there yeah actually and sorry then, i know i'm jumping, <laughs> jumping around a bit but, but another actually advantage i suppose is and it, it leads back to my beginning of my story a bit but um when life gets in the way and you know of investing and you don't have the time to put into researching the individual stocks investing in investment trusts for income can be very suitable for the lazy investor because you can invest in maybe a four five six investment trusts which are maybe global or three or four different themed ones that you think might maybe do a little bit better but if they're a dividend hero or if they have a a growing dividend policy you can more or less sit back throw up the feet and let the money roll in and maybe a, a simple question again what do they pay the dividends from it's nearly all actually all it's from income dividends from uh, companies they invest in now there yeah, is okay. actually two there is two dividend policies uh, mm -hmm. one is a traditional uh, dividend company we've just talked about like a city of London, as an example, that has been paying a raising dividend for 57 years. Yeah, and that's not a bad uh, a, a strategy. But then there's another dividend uh, policy which came out around 2012, and that's an enhanced dividend policy. And what what that actually means, that's a bit of an unusual policy. But what it means is that the investment company itself um, can pay a set dividend to NAV. So as an example, the, one of the most famous one uh, investment trusts that does this would be JP Morgan Global Growth and Income. It's very big, a couple of billion in size. But what they do is they guarantee that they will pay 1% uh, of their NAV 
every single quarter as a dividend. Now they 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 may not have that. So they may have maybe 80% of that payment. But what they would do is they would clean out some profits. They would sell down some profits in that given um quarter to give yeah, you exactly. your guaranteed. Yeah. But if you were to I I have a big holding, one of my main holdings in, in them and they have over the last five years they have increased their dividend seven uh, percent per year on average. Yeah. You know, um, so it's it's it has worked for them, and I think they've had spectacular performance. You know, they, and their their main holdings would be in like Microsoft, Nvidia, uh, Coca Cola uh, companies that we all know, Mastercard, stuff like that. Um, a lot of growth, but it gives them. Good so effectively, I could uh, turn my dividend growth portfolio into an investment trust. Close them fund, yeah, and sh yeah. Uh, sell shares into it. Issue, for instance, uh, 100 shares and sell a few to Derek <laughs> and uh, enjoy <laughs> it both, and then uh, charge him the management fees. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you've, you've, you've mentioned Dividend Hero quite a few times actually on, on the run through there. And um, what, what, what is a Dividend Hero? What does that mean? Um, so a Dividend Hero is any investment trust that increases its dividend for 20 consecutive years or more now as it currently stands out of the 400 investment trusts that the aic have on their books there is um about 30 dividend heroes um and 10 of which of those have increased them um by or have increased them for over 50 years so it's a it's a it's a fair uh, achievement, really. You know, on, on an American level, they would put them as a, as kings. You know, dividend kings. Yeah. Yeah. But then uh, there is a next generation as well. They call them next generation dividend heroes. And actually, if you're looking for investing, that's where I would look because if you look at the dividend heroes, some of them are only you know they're increasing their dividend by you know one two percent you know half a percent just just to keep their keep themselves there now you know they actually tend to be quite a good investment because they're extremely low beat and not very much volatility because people buy them they buy them yeah. for the, the income and they never sell them and if you look at their share price a lot of them they're not too too volatile but if you move into the next generation the ones um there's about again 30 ish um, but they have to have increased their dividend for more than 10 years and less than 20 because obviously when they go above 20 they become a dividend hero but again it's worth looking in there some of them are growing their dividend quite fast and it's worth looking there like it go on yeah yeah and I, I wanted to ask like when, when are you talking like what is the benefit for let's say for such managers to make an investment trust and not like build the next berkshire Hathaway to just have, be a holding company yeah it's actually the, the the only main huge advantage that i could see to it is ta their tax advantage because if they give out 85 percent of their mm -hmm. income they don't pay any uh capital gains yeah, tax on the sales and any stamp duty yeah. um so it, it, whereas if they went the berkshire hathaway route there would be double taxation so they would yeah. be selling yeah. down chairs and it, it wouldn't be an advantage to them yeah, yeah. okay but um, yeah, I mean, from the perspective, uh, and we, we touched on it earlier on, and we were talking about dividend heroes and next generation dividend heroes. I think the one of the huge advantages in that in that sort of realm is um, non-aligned asset types, because us as investors, we 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 tend to have a lot of equity uh, investments. Whereas if we if we went this sort of route with investment trusts, we could look at maybe private equity, hedge funds copper bonds or you know specialists like biotech mm -hmm. or medical healthcare you know and uh, especially with private equity there's assets there that we would never get as small retail investors there's assets we wouldn't be able to get her so is there really. an uh, is there an investment trust that owns lego for instance i'm not sure um I'm not that sure, would be my what... dream yeah to have some yeah. some stake in lego yeah you know actually um scottish mortgage owns a very large stake in spacex um ah. but, yeah and they have a very interesting track record because um they started in around 1909 scottish mortgage mm -hmm. and um, they actually their mandate from the very beginning in 1909 to this day has always been invest in new uh disruptive 
technologies. Yeah. <laughs> and their very first disruptive technology in 1909 was in rubber plantations in Malaysia for a new starting off technology called motor vehicles. <laughs> for tires. It was yeah, for tires, yeah, yeah. for cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But their track record spectacular. They they put up the, the startup cap capital for Amazon. They put mm -hmm. up the startup cat uh, capital for Tesla. Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they actually got in a lot of, um, they've had, they're on sale at the moment, actually, if you're interested in investment, they're completely, they, they're, you know, they're, they're considered to be e exceptionally growthy and maybe the market didn't have an appetite for that over the last two year period. So their yeah. share price took an absolute hammering there over the last one. But, uh, inter yeah. you know, interesting uh, on the private equity front, yeah. There's actually yeah. A, a private equity company on the next generation dividend heroes, uh, CT private equity, as far as I, I remember. I think we need to note some of those down uh, uh, for the description for our listeners. But look, re re really simple, right? Uh, sometimes I wonder, like, how would my portfolio look like? Let's say, let's say, right? I would be getting terminal ill. I know I would half a year, I have half a year to live. What? How do you prepare your po portfolio for your your wife and your your kids, right? And then investment trust of the city of London. If you just want them to have income. With a mm. low beta volatility, for me these are the perfect widow uh, investments here. Mm. You can kind of rely on them probably for the next few decades, uh, so that they can benefit still from the income compared to maybe otherwise a savings account, right, which gets eaten up mm. uh, as well. That this kind yeah, of no. comes across to me those those standard ones. Yeah, I, I actually, if I, I would pick J.P. Morgan Global Growth and Income. Like mm -hmm. it, it started in um, in 1887, and it started providing a startup capital for uh, American railways across yeah. the states, and it, it's been around ever since. And it has um, it has that enhanced dividend policy I talked about, but yeah. it has a, a lot of growth in there as well. Like they had, uh, I think maybe they would have outperformed the S and P if you looked at them over the last ten years, and they still managed to give out the four percent. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and their, their fees are not mad high. I think maybe around half a percent. That could be yeah. it's their thereabouts. Um, so it's it's not not mad high, but it, that's that's your. I consider myself a lazy investor, and <laughs> and that's one I would uh, I like to hang my hat on fairly regular. Yeah. yeah. So so tell me then when you're when you're researching a new investment trust, what what do you look for, or what should someone that's new to this what should we look for when when starting out in the investment trust yeah actually investment trusts they're easy enough to to well look they're maybe easy if you have an, a, a great interest in it right but if you're maybe coming at it maybe a bit raw or, or coming at it for, and not great have don't have great experience of it they might be a bit too but number one the macro story it needs to have a good story i think i think investing is all about the story uh, to some degree um i always check through the annual accounts i think uh, and they're easily assessed on the on the, the isc website and i have a good read through those it always talks about the the investment policy like i'm currently research researching with myself at the moment international public partnerships i haven't bought any of it but and uh, i've read their their annual statement but the reason i've interested in reading that particular annual statement is I want to see that they have uh, legacy money coming, you know, that they have a good track record, a good pipeline of cash, that they're a concession company. So it's tow, tow roads, ports, stuff like that. And the last thing I want is to invest in them. And then uh, the tow road concession finish in, you know, two years time or three years time sort of. So you get all of that information from their annual reports you know what their legacy contracts are and where they're finishing and what's their annual pipeline and um, then a, another one and it's a huge advantage is z scores okay. um uh, not 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 sort of widely known but the z score is how far off the average the discount is so if, if on average over a five-year period their discount is say say five percent so they're, they're trading at a premium and actually uh, international public partnerships their average is actually 7%, right? Yeah. Uh, so they trade at a premium, but in reality, they're a bond proxy. So people buy them for income, you know, and, but because people are able to have been able to recently drop them, 
and buy bonds for cash, they have actually, their discount has fell to minus 21%. So they went from plus seven to minus 21. Now that's on sale in anyone's book at the moment. That's why I'm so interested in them. So that's a Z scores, you know, assessing how far off their average. You will find that that average data on Trustnet. It provides a it provides a graph for every investment trust of how far they're off their their average. It's it's a good tool. Uh, low levels of gearing. We talked about that. So i.e. low levels of debt. Um, numbers of years of dividend cover. You go on the AIC website, go to the dividend section for the company. You'll see that they have maybe one point three. And that means 1.3 years of dividend cover sitting in their bank okay. account. So if they did nothing next year, got no income in, they still have 1.3 years of dividend ready to go. So that yeah. that's that's healthy. That's good, worth knowing. Um, the percentage of fees, we talked briefly about fees, but look, fees are important. We all know that. Um, I The 1% range is sort of there, thereabouts. You will find some of the property ones could be up three or Five percent, you know, because they have look those real estate investment trusts have a lot of property managers, a lot of overheads to, to factor in. But look, fees are important, and you want to have read your annual report, figure out how they're working out the fees. So um, that that's an important point. Dividend growth. Go on the ASC website. They have and go to the dividend section again. You're able to see that how over the last five year period, what has to be your average dividend growth. I'd like to see, ideally, for them to be on par with inflation or thereabouts. Uh, I suppose we all want to see that. Um, actually, uh, I think uh, I had looked at international public partnerships, the ones we were talking about. They were only 2.5%, yeah. but as a sort of a bond proxy, you would kind of be half expecting that. Uh, another way of valuing things would be the, the manager CV. Make sure he'd been there for a few years. Make sure he, that you think he's going to stay there. Because investment trusts actually drop in share price when the manager leaves. People are worried about what the next manager is going to do, what he's going to be like. Like City of London, the one we talked about, uh, John, the manager there is called a guy called Job Curtis. He's been in that job for 37 years. So the, he's considered a steady pair of hands, you know. I can and he, he's not at retirement age, which is the, which is the main thing. Yeah, but yeah. And then the, look, the, the last point I'd add to that would be trust performance both NAB performance and share price performance, because the share price may be down, but when you look at the NAV, it may be up. And that means that the, the manager is actually doing quite a good job. He's built up the NAV of the company, he's built up the net, the net asset values, but maybe the market doesn't believe it for one reason or another, or they're just out of favor, they're not involved that particular style. So uh, yeah, so both NAV performance and share price performance, just assess them together. And I think you mentioned also now and also earlier a little bit when you were talking about the net asset value, because sometimes people may be looking at the net asset value and then they want to see the share price exactly the same. And when it's, let's mm -hmm. say, two, three percent below, they say, oh, it's undervalued. What I always learned about investment trust is that you really need to look and, that, and that's, I think, what you were saying to the average delta mm -hmm. between the share price exactly. and the NAV over, let's say, I don't know, the last five years or something like that. Five and use that as an anchor point to to track is this is the price now you know around the average of what it is in the delta with the net asset value right and i think yeah. i think this is something that people don't usually grasp uh because they might read okay uh you need to look at the net asset value it's what the comp what the trust is worth and then they just think like oh if it's below great buy it if it's uh above wait but mm. it's, it's not giving us the full story i think uh no, 100%. You you need to be always assessing it against its average. Maybe I always use a five year average. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And, th and then, look, we, we spoke a lot of positive things about investment trusts, but we all know every investment has some risks or some downsides to them. So, what, what kind of risks are involved with investment trusts? I know you mentioned managers there briefly. Um, and then, how, how would you mitigate, mitigate against them typically? Yeah, so we, we actually hit on the managers, and that was going to be maybe my first one to talk about. I don't know if you if you read the Financial Times, but there's a guy who writes in there a good bit called Simon Edelston. Yeah. Um, and uh, Simon, he, he was actually, his his day job was uh, the manager of uh, Midway Investment Trust, a very old, well-established, but really well-performing investment trust. Um, a total return 
total return approach. But anyway, he um, when he left, their 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 uh, their discount uh, dropped by about three four percent, literally overnight. So you and you, but he but he left to retire, you know. Um, yeah. And it was it was a very genuine reason. So if you can find a manager who's in their late forties, <laughs> early fifties, that's you know it's worth it's worth noting for sure that that's that can be a risk if the manager leaves. Often the new manager comes. There's a betting in period. Everything's fine. But as a, look, another manager, um, a guy called James Anderson, he managed Scottish Mortgage, and I remember in about 2021 uh i remember you know he announced he was leaving and everything and uh my god and he, he sort of hinted that people should sell the shares that they were very high at the time to and uh, then 22 came the next year share price dropped 40 percent right now i'm not saying it was fully because he left but it definitely had and tom yeah, slater the guy who took over i nearly felt sorry for the guy i nearly sent him a letter just to pat him on the back and say everything's going to be all right you know but 40 percent drop is something to take on and it's a it's a fair uh, problem but again you know, look going back to it the manager is a risk for sure um, yeah. but um look forest uh forex risk you know foreign yeah. uh, currency Foreign-y. exchange yeah. yeah because you know they're mainly bought and sold in um in pound sterling now there is euro and dollar versions of a good few investment trusts and you can you can actually find them but how i actually balance out the forex risk is um i actually buy a lot through um interactive brokers yeah and i leave i leave the currency in i leave the currency in uh, any transactions in uh pound sterling and i leave the dividends in pound sterling and i just nearly always just reinvest it so i avoid the, the forex but of course if i was depending on it 100 percent for for to live off there would be a risk there now but of course look sterling has been quite a stable currency relatively speaking yeah and um, the discount we, we've talked about that now yeah. it's not i don't think it's a huge risk for us as income investors because we're buying and setting and forgetting really you know we just want we want the income whereas if you're a total return investor and if you were buying a company there is a lot of investment trusts out there that pay no dividend and they grow like mad, you know, like Allianz Technology Trust or Polar Capital Trust or Smithson or any of these. They're designed as just just to grow. Yeah. Um, but if I was depending on those, well, and you were depending that you were going to have to sell a few percent of those every year to live, well, I wouldn't be sleeping at night anyway. If it was me. Yeah. But the discount could crawl through the floor because the manager could leave or something could happen, you know. So discount could be a risk if you're going for that total return approach or that growth approach. And then um, high high gearing can be a risk, especially in the property sector because they have to recapitalize, especially at the moment. Uh, if you run through uh, an inflationary period and interest rates go up, and maybe they're coming out of a ten-year cycle of extremely low uh, rates, so uh, yeah, gearing can be a risk to them. So, and and is is it fair to say then if a if a fund is underperforming for a number of years, there's a fear that they just might close up shop altogether and you, and you completely lose out they nearly never close up shop they're actually yeah. generally assumed into another uh, investment trust if you take uh, as an example uh, um, scottish investment trust very very old investment trust that actually was uh, bought by uh, jp morgan global growth and income and yeah. um, that that's happened with quite a good few in trusts actually another thing that happened with trusts and the reason why trusts survive for such a long period of time is they constantly reinvent themselves so you you have a trust it's a company it has a board the board's job is to look after its uh, investors and its shareholders and if if it believes the shareholders are not being well served by an investment manager the investment manager in most cases isn't an employee he is he or she is a separate company and they have to tender for for the ability to be that manager so often you will see that investment trusts, if things are going very badly, they put it out to the market and then say, we want a new investment team. And then uh, an investment house like Bailey Gifford or one of these big investment houses will come forward and say, right, so instead of investing in small Asian companies, we are going to change the remit and we are going to invest in Icelandic widgets and you're going to get this return. And what do you think of it, guys? And here's our fee to do it. And that's actually, the, it's a tender process and they reinvent themselves. So even though we said that Scottish mortgage started by uh, 
you know, investing in rubber plantations in Malaysia. Well, I mean, they have to reinvent themselves because there's only so much of that you can do, you know? Yeah, yeah. 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 And, then, and then maybe one last question before we move on to some of the listeners' questions. Um, is there any resources, you mentioned AOC, but maybe books um, or podcasts that you recommend to learn more about? investment trusts um yeah <laughs> i don't want to be advertising too many podcasts uh, on your podcast um but um jonathan davis uh, he has a podcast um money makers podcast it comes out every saturday afternoon it just specifically looks at investment trusts actually and a, a great book that's free of charge actually on um on amazon well the ebook version is is the investment in an investment trust handbook it comes out at the middle of december every year great book and uh well worth getting i would highly recommend it but actually one of the, the books that got me started in investment trusts was one by john barons it's called um, the financial times guide to investment trusts the name is quite ironic in that it's the unlocking the the city's best kept secret because i honestly believe that to be the truth Nice. yeah yeah but in th those two books 100 percent, i would recommend for investment trusts yeah awesome, awesome. No. yeah i i i listen no. to money makers and, and jonathan davis is it's a brilliant show it's very informative he gets a lot of the fund managers on themselves yeah um, and he's not afraid to ask him the hard questions i have to say he, he does give them a hard time sometimes um but yeah fantastic podcast um, and that handbook as you say you send that on to me nearly every year to be fair too so it is a yeah. it is an awesome resource do you know um he's actually a good he's a good author in his own right he wrote another very good book there a few years ago called uh, templeton's way okay. it's a, a biography of sir john Ta john templeton and yeah. that is a spectacular book highly recommend it yeah very good yeah so Oh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, for me, uh, you know, I I know the theory about investment trusts. Uh, not really. Well, Green Coat uh, UK Wind, I believe I have, uh, which was my uh, losing my virginity in this space, let's say. Mm -hmm. And there is something to it because what is maybe very interesting for me and also other listeners, it's like all of these are in the UK, right? And that means we don't pay dividend tax. We pay the tax then in our own country, but we mm -hmm. don't need to worry about double taxation treaties and such and that, that's the beauty of investing in the uk and then specifically therefore also uh, very interesting to learn a bit more about investment trusts because we see them they pop up on the dividend uh, screeners here and there but uh, yeah then i think like myself as well i was for a long time very alien to it because you feel like okay what's this yeah it's not an index fund so what is this so i think and i hope that our listeners really got a bit more clarity on this now uh, uh, about this topic, which I think deserves probably the uh, a nice place in uh, in a dividend growth portfolio. Mm. Yeah, they fit. They, they like we said earlier, they fit so well into a dividend growth portfolio. They're they're the original dividend growth portfolio. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll jump straight into some questions. Um, and Mike um, has asked us about. Is there any green investment trusts that you like? And he's mentioned two. He's mentioned Trig, uh, T R I G, or Green Coat Renewables. Um, green Coat Renewables. I uh, I had said it to you. I think previously about uh, you know even though it's a UK investment trust, it's a uh, it's a uh, an Irish investment trust with a green coat on it. Yeah, because it's. <laughs> It has its secondary listing in Dublin, and uh, its manager is Paul O'Donnell, an Irish guy. Yeah. yeah so, um, but yeah, I, I like that. And um, God, there's, there's just so many to be honest. Um, if you go to the AIC website and you filter on the environmental section, yeah. you will get maybe 10, 15 pop up immediately, and yeah. you can have his, his choice of any of them. There's just there's so many of them. But which uh, which which one would you would you prefer? Do you have a preference? Wind, solar. Is there any particular? Well, on the solar front, I own I own uh, Next Energy uh, okay. Solar Fund. Uh, it has a nine percent dividend, nine ten percent dividend, um, and I, I have found that very good. It's trading at a good discount at the moment as well. It's a good time to buy it. Um, I also own Green Coat Renewables. I yeah. like that. It's it's nice and broad. It, it fits in well. Um, yeah, they're, that's they're the, the two main ones I have. Um, 
I've, I've, I've Aquila European renewables. They're actually, if you're looking for a probably turnaround, and I'm sure if you're interested in a turnaround story, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they could be a good turnaround story. They're trading at a big discount as well. And uh, funny enough, they could be they could be worth purchasing. You know, I think they're going to be assumed into another investment trust as well. Okay. Uh, and what actually happens when that when that occurs? So say they're trading at a discount at the moment of thirty odd percent, but for the the other company to buy them, they have to effectively to talk the shareholders into selling their shares they have to make it work for a while so they will they even though it might be trading at a 30 percent discount uh, they'll probably buy it at a 20 percent discount so if you bought it today you could in theory get a 10 percent turnaround on your money you know plus you will get the, the shares in the bigger company i think they're being i think uh, octopus renewable which is a massive uh, renewables company um, again, uh, are talking about buying them, another one worth looking at, but they're always trading at a sort of a high premium. I've always found them expensive, I've never purchased, but, but you, if you bought Aquila European Renewables, you could indirectly end up with shares in them. Yeah. yeah. Um, Gordon has asked us, is there any tech stocks with a decent starting yield? Um, and I suppose this probably means both the investment trust world, but also in the normal dividend investing world as well. Yeah, well, in the trust world, there's two very famous ones, um, which will be Allianz Technology Trust. Yeah, it's actually, and then uh, Polar Capital Technology Trust. But you're looking at like they, if you want a company that's going to outcompete the S&P by a multiple, well, historically that's what they've done over the last ten years. But with regard to dividend, there isn't any because technology, as we know, technology companies just don't pay yield. It's to pump all their money. Now, I know, obviously, Facebook has just started and stuff like that, but um, it's nothing substantial. Now, I know Microsoft do pay a little bit as well, but, well, they pay reasonable. Growing I, I think it, it all comes down to the valuation uh, of the stock. And if there is something with a decent starting yield, there are typically broken stocks at the moment uh, because True. all tech is on fire. But um, there, there's also a second question to Gordon, uh, Derek, and that is like, whether we see already that the power of compounding let's say so what he's saying is like most of us see more dividends coming in because the money that they deploy into the market but do we already uh, see the effect of dividend raises and i can give a simple example right um, if you're now around the ten thousand uh, euro of annual income and you get an average dividend hike for your whole portfolio of let's say four and a half percent that's 450 euro that might not sound a lot but if you need to deploy your cash at a 3% dividend yield, you're talking here about 15,000 euro that you don't need to deploy anymore. Yeah. So while sometimes uh, such a value on such a number doesn't maybe feel like a lot, but if you would need to deploy cash for that money, it's a lot and 15,000 yeah, for, for most people. So uh, I, with that being said, I can definitely feel it already, but you need to really understand the math behind it because otherwise sometimes it may feel pennies. But if you start to think about what, what would you need to invest to get this, get a similar hike, then suddenly you start seeing like, whoa, this is like half a year of investments or something like that. Yeah. 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 I, I think it depends on the size of your portfolio. Really. If you have a small portfolio starting out, you, you won't feel it as much. Um, Abraham has asked us about, um, he said in Jack Bogle's book, um, he states the reason why the stock market always moves up is because of earnings and dividend yield of companies. That's it. He thinks everything else is just noise. Would you agree or disagree? Well, there's no uh, neutral uh, uh, option in this question, so I have to agree with this one. I think that in the long run, earnings really drive the share price and, and not the way around. And I also believe that while companies, that they mature over time and at a certain moment you see like, okay, I've got so much cash flowing in when you're uh, a popular company, and then you can do two things. Am I going to reinvest it? Uh, yeah, into into new projects in the company, but but think about um, Google as an example. Now, I mean, they, they they are still investing heavily, but for me, they need to really start thinking now about dividends. Yeah, yeah. because they are still so cash rich 
And I believe that shareholders would be better off by getting a, a piece of that cash and allocating it elsewhere themselves. Yeah, and, and that's often the, the capital allocation discussion uh, decision that management needs to make. And I think this is also why Meta started to, to pay a dividend now. Sometimes at a certain moment, you're at this stage of the maturity that you simply have, have too much cash, you can't invest at all. So then it is either buybacks or dividends. And I think dividends are more popular with, with the larger shareholder community. And bear in mind, uh, Jack Bogle during the 70s, uh, there was no buybacks. They weren't allowed at the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. They, they wouldn't have uh, come into his thinking at, at all. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, good point, good point. Um, Marek has asked us, um, do you think that all the substantial dividend hikes that we are seeing lately um, are caused by inflation? No, actually not. Um, some companies, of course, have been able to hike their prices above inflation. But let's, let's not forget that most companies also had their cost inflating. Yeah, so in the end, I still think that most hikes are just I mean, I see two kinds of hikes. I see suddenly double digit hikes where the earnings were not growing double digits and actually slowing down. And I have a feeling that somehow management is trying to compensate for the total return or something like that. Maybe they, maybe it's part of their uh, bonus policy. I don't know. Yes, yeah, some, some companies have this. Um, but I think generally some companies are just doing really well. And I think still in many areas, the consumer is still strong. Yeah, think about uh, some of the uh, like like evolution gaming 35 percent i mean they're still selling lots of lots of those live casino games yeah so it's just on fire so, some of those businesses and you see the others that are struggling they do like this token uh, hike like 3m or something like that yeah yeah um Actually, uh, there is a few, going back to the investment trust team, but uh, companies like uh, LXI uh, REIT or um, Green Coat Renewables or International Public Partnerships, they all have inflation linked contracts. So they, and because they're an investment trust and they have to distribute 85% of their income, they that is inflation linked because they have to dump it out to their, as a dividend. And some of them last year were issuing special dividends. I got a few in. So, uh, because they just had too much money and they were going to fall outside the right pipe, <laughs> the five percent remit, <laughs> not a bad problem in life, but no, yeah. definitely not. Yeah. But to, to your point, that sounds exactly what we always learn about real estate investment trusts from the US, right? Uh, they, they have these uh, rate escalators in there, or um, we spoke one time with the CEO from uh, Difama, right? They yeah. also have this uh, written in some of their contracts about something like inflation hedge or something like that in there so yeah very interesting um andrew has asked us the question about berkshire hathaway um what do you make of their portfolio changes buying more oil and selling more bp I think that uh, it was quite nice that they bought Chevron because I was looking into the oil majors the other day and, and, and Chevron for me was definitely uh, one of the best position there valuation wise also looking at the future um, uh, oil reserves yeah, and selling out of uh, HP Inc totally I think what they are missing what they probably liked in it is the buybacks but what they are probably missing is the, the share price uh, appreciation here so you know, he's been selling them, but uh, I'm sticking to it. I, I like this company a lot. I've got more patience than Warren. Warren is probably counting his days. <laughs> <laughs> You're in it for the long haul. <laughs> exactly. I have two large positions in BP and Exxon, and uh, I, I'm very bullish on oil. Um, yeah, I, same here. It's um, actually, if you want to read a, a very good book, um, The Material World by Ed Conway. It only came out a couple of months ago, but uh, he has a uh, six materials that the world needs. Uh, very interesting stuff, and it's completely investor focused. And oil, salt, sand, lithium, iron. Now you'd have to wonder why sand and salt fit in there, but when you read it, it's amazing. Like you can't have semiconductors without, without sand. So, uh, and actually, interestingly enough, America has the purest silica sand in the world, and that's why they, NVIDIA make the best nice. semiconductors. So, uh, no, but uh, going back to his oil uh, thesis, 
my gosh, uh, for the Western world, especially, you know, uh, no drilling licenses. Yeah. And uh, so you're, and everyone needs more oil. There has been an underinvestment in uh, capital expenditures. Uh, and, and, you know, this is where it's also a bit worrisome because you see more and more of the, the activists being successful, that things turn into law but but it will bite us as society right mm -hmm. so but hey in the in the end uh, energy is still one of my biggest sectors and shells my biggest position so li like you yeah. i'm quite bullish on this bp bp jumped five percent uh a week ago because the new ceo said yeah. he was going to start buybacks yeah yeah happy days for him yeah <laughs> well the issue i have personally with bp is deep horizon and and how that mm. could happen and i still haven't really seen a proper cleansing in this company um yeah because this was a this was in my opinion this was a mistake of of really the culture in bp and mm. and that's why i shied away from it maybe they fixed it but it is something that still sticks in my head when deep horizon happened in 2010 uh, they sent um one of their best engineers down to fix it and he was bernard looney mm -hmm. the, their previous uh, irish ceo and you know i was always a great fan of him since then uh, when you read how he fixed it but uh it was a crying shame how he actually what happened and how that whole saga played out in the end it was yeah. a, but uh, and also I lost a bit of faith in them in 2020 when they cut the bloody dividend, which was a bit annoying at the time. Anyway, yeah. look, they're uh, I still think they're I still think they're worth holding for sure. Uh, they have great assets, uh, BP, yeah. and and to your point, also a lot a lot undervalued uh, still today. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, Simon has asked us a more specific question um, based on our Irish backgrounds. Um, so if the deemed disposal rule would fall away in the future, would you then favor UCIT ETFs over investment trusts? So personally, I think they both would have investment trusts by a country mile, which is an Irish statement, <laughs> but <laughs> investment, investment trusts completely for income, 100%. They could not be touched. Right, uh, but ETFs. If you're looking for, you know, something just to, to completely set and forget, like an all-world ETF that you stick in your pension or something like that, that you're going to knock out just uh, maybe a six, seven percent a year, all going really, really well, and you don't have to touch it. I think, you know, they they would both play a part in your portfolio. I think personally, if deem disposal didn't exist, I don't know what you what do you think. Yeah, yeah, theme disposal is is one of my pet peeves. I, I speak about it a lot on here, um, but I, I agree with you in terms of income, as you said. What I like about investment trusts is you have a clear policy. You, you know what mm. you're getting. True. The manager has to give a clear statement of whether it's growth, or whether it's dividends, you, you know what you're getting and you can benchmark their performance off that. You, you don't get that same flavor or level of ETFs, but but like that, ETFs would definitely have. I think if if we didn't have the deemed disposal rule, I might not even do stock picking as much. It would be more ETFs and, and maybe some funds there. But yeah, we see there's there's lots of talk, isn't there, uh, front around Ireland around this deemed disposal rule. Whether we'll get rid of it, hopefully we will, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I uh, income ETFs you really have to dig into the weeds about the policy of how it's actually structured because some of them maybe you know you can get an s p a dividend aristocrat etf well that's fine you know what you're getting there but there's a lot of other income ones you know they have uh, strategies about what sort of yield they'll only invest in and how it's actually structured needs to you, you really need to carefully assess it before you invest i think yeah yeah agreed um dionis has asked us about um, some popular income trusts. So he's talking about the City of London, Finsbury Growth and Income, or the Global Bankers. Do you see an advantage over UK ETFs? Yeah, so um, the three of those actually are quite different. So City of London, uh, that's your king, your, your 57 years uh, dividend hero. Um, 
if you look at those, their investment remit is 100% FTSE 100. It's in reality a FTSE 100 income tracker. That's what you're getting there, you know. Um, but there's a lot to be said for it as well because you're you're guaranteed to have a growing dividend. They, the City of London will never let it go because they're involved in so many other funds. They're purchased by so many pensions. They're part of annuities. They're, they have to keep a growing dividend and they will at all costs. Whereas uh, uh, Finsbury growth and income, they shouldn't even have income in their name when you actually get into the weeds with them. It's a growth trust. Uh, the income bit is a legacy from somewhere, I don't know. Um, and uh, Michael Linzel, their their manager, is a really good guy. I've heard him speak loads, but he's really out of favour lately. Even his own trust, um, Linzel, Linzel Sale, um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I actually bought it because it's actually a, his, other, his own investment trust because it's a dividend, next generation dividend hero. It's trading at a 6% dividend and uh, he's had spectacular um, a record over the years, but he's trading at a massive discount. So I just bought it, but famous for growth and income, I don't know. It's very much, it's UK focused as well. I, look, it's growthy, not much income. And then bankers, bankers about one and a half percent yield. You know, uh, it's a global, it's a global focused portfolio. I, I, I guarantee you, if you look at those and compare definitely bankers against a UK ETF, it will have outperformed it massively every year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then Richard has asked us, or asked you, um, I should say, about Nextar Energy Solar Fund. I think you mentioned them earlier on. Um, mm. They're currently trading at a huge discount, 31%. The yield is 11%. But yeah. they have a gearing of 80%. Yeah, well, so I can't say much considering I bought them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I bought them for sure. Look, the yield is terribly tempting, isn't it? Um, and when you look, the 80% gearing is actually mortgage gearing. It, it's actually genuine mortgage. Uh, they took a mortgage to buy land and these assets. So it's asset-backed mortgages. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not just genuine... Um, it's backed by real collateral, yeah. so I wouldn't be overly worried by it. Um, but do you see any risks with this with this type of fund? Because I mean, I, a lot of our listeners and we, we do have some beginner listeners here, and they might see eleven percent yield and, and think, uh, oh, let, "Let's let's let's buy this." And I suppose what I get, want to get across is what's what's the big risk here? The big risk to that is that they're very much um, subsidised by government. Um, uh, by the government giving them premium rates for solar because they want to encourage it. Yes. And if th if that vanished in two or three years' time, they they would probably vanish behind them. Yeah. Similar to UK Wind, I would say. Um, we're also getting this. Yeah. Yeah. Which. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a risk, but I don't see it leaving in two or three years, considering we have this twenty thirty and twenty forty and twenty fifty targets that we have to meet in terms of renewable energy. But you know, all the renewables, I, I, you know, it's something that I've been meaning to do a lot more research on it, but I, I do have, when you look at their, uh, their depreciation calculations, you have to wonder uh, for solar and wind, and I do have two investments in them, but you have to wonder that for a wind turbine or a solar farm that will, within 20 years, just not be producing any goods, you have to wonder how close to reality the depreciation calculations are it, i know i looked that's just a bit of a random fact but uh... <laughs> <laughs> we, we 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 could get into this i mean it is it is in my uh competence as an electrical engineer by uh, when i was in college it moved more into automation so that would be a, definitely an interesting conversation but we won't won't bore our listeners on that um but maybe one last question and it is still around the renewable in renewable groups um how would you compare someone like Trig, who, who you mentioned earlier, um, to UK um, Greencoat, Greencoat UK? All those, all those renewable companies are, were effectively bond proxies. Yeah. So people, people were buying them for income. Um, and I see, you know, he mentioned um, the big di discount at the moment. They're all trading at big discounts because people have effectively left them to yeah. move on to the bonds. Um, but with regard to the two of those, they're very similar. Um, I suppose 
where uh, renewables trade I think it, look, I tell you what's worth what someone it would be worth someone looking at would be how much of their income is inflation linked. And whichever has the higher percentage would probably be the one to do more research into. Yeah. Because uh they would be very similar apart from that. And that would be one advantage if one of them had it over the other. Yeah. Um okay, that's the last listener's question. But maybe maybe there's one investment trust that you haven't mentioned that you maybe like like to mention we sometimes we do a stock pick of the week we won't call it a stock pick of the week but is there one that you feel like you should have mentioned that we haven't touched on yeah so um let me see uh i well i had talked about international uh public partnerships i haven't yeah. bought that but i have been i have started to research it and then another one um would be uh blackrock world mining okay and it's sort of we we hit on it there earlier on with um the material world when i read that i actually went and bought the black <laughs> world mining after when you realize actually if you if you go to their annual account uh or their annual statement i mean and, and just have a, have a look through it they have a, a, a great schematic in there and it actually they show how much raw materials it takes to make one megawatt and I actually printed it out because I thought it was just a great one megawatt of electricity. It takes 300 tons of iron ore, 500 tons of concrete, 900 uh, tons of non-recyclable plastic, a thousand tons of copper. Wow. For one megawatt, the one megawatt is not that much electricity, but you know, your standard coal plant is maybe seven, eight, nine megawatts. You know, it, it's not, it's not huge. Um, no. and, and where's the world? <laughs> <laughs> going to get all that and it's true the it's true the miners you now and if you look at blackrock world mining for from from our perspective as income investors you know it's up on eight percent yeah as a of a dividend and then if you look at what's under the hood you have every large world miner that you can think of uh glencore bp rio tinto uh barry gold Vale, any anyone you can think of is in that mix um no, they, they're not. If you actually read their dividend policy, they're not. Um, they're, they can't rely on their dividend because their underlying assets don't have growing dividend policies. Um, yeah. So what they, what their, I've heard their manager interviewed a few times, and what he's said is, uh, they will give it as they as they have it. But in fairness to him, he's managed to, over the last five years grow by seven or eight percent every single year and um, so he has tried to control it as best he can because he knows that's what people are looking for but um yeah no i look blackrock world mining for sure is definitely one worth considering it's actually when we were talking about the z scores and how far off the average the discount is it's actually not that far about three four percent off average it is lower than its average at the moment yeah yeah um i think it's trading at a discount of about six percent where it's average at about minus three percent so it's you know it's just with minus three percent off average okay yeah so maybe it's one worked someone to consider yeah it looks uh it sounds interesting but i mean in terms of the dividend growth we paid as we have it we're prepared to have a reliable yeah. dividend so it wouldn't be one mm -hmm. that would personally interest me but i can i can see the reason in in behind it um but it, it just seems the dividend is a little bit unstable from my liking but it's I'm sure some of our listeners will, will look into it and, and tell me different. Yeah, the, the secondary one we talked about, international public partnerships, they are uh, a dividend hero and a growing dividend policy. And they're at, I don't know, six odd percent, I think, of that, uh, at the moment of the yield. So yeah. worth considering. Mm -hmm. Nice one. Well, listen, Andrew, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Um, it's a topic, as we said, we haven't covered, and I think you gave us a, a good base there from some of the basics right through to maybe even some more advanced parts of it. Um, so thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about investment trusts. No problem. Uh, I, I understand it was sort of a, an avalanche of information, <laughs> but uh, look, it'll be a starting point. The ASC website, the books we talked about, it'll be a starting point for people anyway. Yeah. Um, and we'll do our best to link to these websites, these books, and um, most of these tickers as well to give people a favor of, of what we said. I, I know our accents can be hard to understand, so I'll, I'll, I'll make a special effort to, 
building toward us. Yeah. Great. Thank Great. you, Andy. It was really, uh, really, really great to hear you talking. And I, I, I'm sure that our listeners found very insightful and they also took some, well, that you, let's say, busted some of the myths maybe even around this and, and just provided general clarity. So thank you. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks. And to our listeners, we will see you all next week. Remember, both of us at David and Talk are not certified financial specialists through formal education. We are just two guys sharing our journey for inspiration and entertainment purposes. Hence, this is not investment advice. Although we do our best, we can't promise that the information discussed is always correct, nor appropriate for you or anybody else. We always recommend that you do your own due diligence and be accountable for your own choices. As we always say, you can't borrow conviction from others. Last but not least, by listening to our podcast, you agree to hold us harmless from any ramifications, financial or otherwise, that occur to you as a result of acting on information provided in this podcast.